We are here tonight for a very important reason. We are uh, very close to the end of two important environmental assessment projects that relate to um, and are key components of uh, revitalization of Toronto's waterfront. This is all not news to you. One being the uh, Donmouth Naturalization and Portland's Flood Protection Project, and the other being uh, the Lower Donlands Infrastructure Class EA. And um, so what's happened is these two projects uh, um, have uh, been reflected on over the last um, uh, period of time. Um, you might have heard about them back in 2010. I think we were in this room thinking we were close to wrapping up the Don Mouth EA and probably around the same time we were talking about the Lower Don Lands and a lot of stuff has happened since then. And I see a lot of familiar faces who have been through uh, with us through the Portlands Acceleration Initiative. But there are also some faces that have been working on this for probably 30 plus years. If that's you, put your hand up. One, two, where's Dalton? Three, four, yes, that was easily 30 plus years. There's also a group of people who have been in an advisory committee capacity for quite a while. Um, and some of you are currently acting, some of you have acted over the last 20 years in an advisory committee role. Put your hand up if that's you. Nice work, nice work and all the shy ones that aren't putting their hands up. Um, so it's because of people like this, I think, that we were here today, but also because there's a lot of um, very hard work being done by um, many uh, um, governments and public agencies to try and make this happen. And um, so it's very exciting to have been part of that team. And so what we're here to do today is um, David Custern from Waterfront Toronto is going to give you a briefing on how things have evolved um, over time and where things are at today. Um, and uh, then we're going to have some time to discuss the presentation, whether you have questions of David. Um, but also, we're very interested in understanding what you like about what you're seeing. If, you, if there's anything you don't like what, about what you're seeing, then let us know. And if you have any suggested refinements at this sort of final uh, stage of the game. And those questions are also on the agenda that you would have picked up when you came in. Um, and there was also a newsletter that you would have picked up that's specific to the Donmouth um, EA that also has a lot of information in it. On the back of your agenda is a worksheet uh, with those same questions that I just read. If you want to um, send us any of your feedback uh, tonight or for the next two weeks, um, then please send it in. All of it will be integrated into the meeting record from tonight. And those of you who are used to coming to these kinds of meetings, you know you will have a copy of that meeting record in draft to confirm that you're comfortable that it reflects what happened here. And then we'll finalize it and it'll be widely uh, distributed. One of the other things that's happening tonight is that Reed and Josh are behind these cameras, um, which is being filmed so that the folks who couldn't come to the meeting can go online and take a look. Um, and that'll be online uh, in the next couple of days, so starting on July 27th. The presentation will be online starting July 26th, and the deadline for comment is August 8th. All of that is in the little box at the bottom of your agenda. And uh, also contact information for the TRCA and Waterfront Toronto uh, if you have uh, more comments you want to provide. Last but not least, um, just something about our role. So I'm here with my colleague Alex Heath. He's going to be taking very detailed notes along with me. Um, our job as facilitators is not to have a vested interest in the outcome of the project, although having worked on it for this long, it's hard not to um, have some sort of interest, but our job is to help facilitate a constructive discussion tonight. So obviously the floor is open for folks who have um, any type of opinion um, on the positive end, on the negative end, somewhere in the middle. Um, that's my job to make sure we have the space for everybody to, to have a go. So that'll, that's what I'll be doing. Um, so I'm going to turn it quickly over to Councillor Fletcher. And uh, she's going to hand it over to David and we'll get rolling. Since this is going to be one of the last meetings, we think, before this is being formally put into the ministry, can I just ask everybody to give a round of applause for Nicole Swearhorn and her tremendous work in leading, in leading us through, uh, I don't think it's 30 years, but definitely it's been many years on this project. I'm here tonight because I love our waterfront and I love what Waterfront Toronto is doing and I want it to go faster and better and greater here in the Portlands. And I know you're here tonight because you love our waterfront, you love what's happening on our waterfront and you want to keep it on course. And I don't think there's anyone in this room who actually uh, has looking at this, it's going to be the uh, EA on the flooding. If you saw what happened at Dundas and uh, the bridge 
all on the Don Valley, if you saw what happened the day of the big rain, you know how important it is that this environmental assessment gets finished, gets into the ministry, and gets approved. And of course, two years ago, we had um, almost derailment, as you all remember. Does everybody remember that, 2011? Yes, you do. And the ship was righted, got back to work, set up the Portland's acceleration between the city, Waterfront Toronto, and the TRCA to actually look at a broader plan in the Portland's, which is quite exciting, and to meet any of the requirements around the environmental assessment to make it successful. So almost two years later, this is going to go in to the ministry after your comments, unless uh, somebody's got some brand new idea that's so great. But I think most of you have been here working on this for years in partnership in, with Waterfront Toronto and the city and the TRCA. And I just want to thank you for all of your time, your commitment, your thoughtfulness, and your passion about Toronto's waterfront, because we're going to make it great in the Portlands. Thanks very much, everybody. And I'd like to introduce David Kasterin from Waterfront Toronto, who's going to take us through this tremendous uh, effort that you've all been engaged in for two years. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks Council. Um, good? And that's it. Thanks. Uh, I'd just like to um, acknowledge um, Matthew Kelway um, sitting at the back. Thank you. Um, Member of Parliament, um, Matthew, if you'd uh, stand up, or I guess just raise your hand. Thank you for coming. So, um, welcome everyone. I uh, want to spend probably about 45 minutes this evening um, talking to you about some of the boards uh, you've seen um, around the room as well as some other slides that you haven't. Um, but to start, um, the... Thanks, that's great. You can see the slides now. Um, want to note that this is a, a mandated uh, public meeting under the uh, um, Ministry of Environments, the province's um, environmental assessment uh, process, we have to have this meeting, but as you know, um, we have consultation meetings at Waterfront Toronto, um, regardless of whether they're mandated. Uh, we think it's important, uh, continues to be important, will always be important to get your feedback and input, um, and we appreciate that you're all here. Um, many of you, uh, if not all of you, have been here in the past, um, and we appreciate that. The, um, what we're here to do today is to give you a bit of an update um, on the work that's been done over the past six or seven, well actually more like eight or nine months um, since we were at council uh, last October. Um, we have uh, made some changes. Is it okay, it's can't hear me? It's hard to hear you, yeah, All right. for some reason. So it's you might have to talk like right into talk that. Talk louder, I can do that. And right into there. Perfect, thank you, I'll get closer. Um, so I want to talk to you a bit about some of the changes that have been made um, um, as we've been going through the process of uh, refining the, the Don Mouth, the flood protection, um, and working on the lower Don lands uh, infrastructure work, um, as well as give you a bit more information on the um, Don Mouth EA, the lower Don lands EA, as well as some of the uh, planning work that's going to start happening uh, actually in the next month or so, and you'll start seeing us out and, out and about in the public uh, with respect to that work as well. Um, one thing to note on this um, slide, however, an important thing that I, I think is missed often when we talk about this is this connection here, the Don Greenway uh, from the Don Watershed through the Portlands into the uh, Lake Ontario Park and Leslie Street Spit, Tommy Thompson Park. This is, um, you know, this is not a small thing. This, this connection from a naturalization, uh, from a... Uh, uh, bird migration uh, for many, many reasons is a very important connection um, and uh, is something that, except in this drawing, we don't really talk about uh, very much. So I just wanted to sort of put that context in place um, as we go on. So just a bit of background um, for those of you who haven't been uh, with us for the last couple of years. Uh, back in 2003, uh, the city um, uh, adopted the Central Waterfront Secondary Plan, um, which is really the document that we've been operating under. Uh, for the last 
10 years now, um, and at the same time, the actual Donmouth EA, notwithstanding we've been talking about this or it's been talked about for 30 years, the actual EA um, became a reality. Um, in 2007, uh, as part of that EA process, or an adjunct to it, um, the uh, design competition for the um, Donmouth occurred, and the uh, um, MVVA plan was selected, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, shortly. Um, 2010 through 2007, a lot of work happened with respect to completing the Donmouth EA, uh, as well as the Lower Donlands Master Plan and Infrastructure EAs um, that went to Council then in uh, 2010. Um, as the Councillor mentioned, in 2011 we kicked off the Portlands Acceleration Initiative um, to look again at the environmental assessment results, uh, to reconfirm the preferred alternative, and to look at how we could um, accelerate both the uh, flood protection as well as development in the Portlands. Um, that process, um, uh, first phase of that process concluded in October of last year. Since then we've been working hard in um, doing technical analysis um, to uh, validate the EA assumptions, uh, confirm our, uh, the impacts of our preferred alternative, and get to this point where we can share that with you so that in about two months uh, we can submit it initially to the MOE for uh, their review uh, in anticipation of getting this finally approved, uh, fully approved by uh, next summer. So, in October, we presented the results of the PLAI Phase uh, 1 um, to Council and um, received their endorsement and approval to proceed to modify the Donmouth EA um, to proceed with um, alternative 4WS um, realigned and uh, to submit that to the Ministry. At the same time, Council directed that we uh, amend to or the existing uh, EA for the Lower Donlands and the um, uh, Lower Donlands Master Plan um, to respect or to reflect those changes that had been made uh, to the flood protection as part of the Portlands Acceleration. Um, and in addition, we are to protect, look at all uh, vehicles, legal, planning and otherwise, uh, to protect the alignment uh, and the corridor of the river to ensure that it's not encroached on by development, um, to complete a framework plan for the Portlands, um, to um, ensure that any development that does happen is done in a, in a smart um, and coordinated way, and then finally to um, confirm the precincts and commence precinct planning uh, for the three um, initial precincts that we looked at, which were Cousins Key, Polson's Key, and the Film Studio District. So, kind of goes without saying, um, you know, why, do, why are we here? We're here because the area highlighted in yellow um, in the uh, event of a Hurricane Hazel um, storm, a storm of that magnitude, uh, a storm that's called a, a regulatory flood, uh, or a regulatory storm, would flood the area from here about Eastern Avenue all the way across through Leslieville to uh, beyond uh, Leslie Street um, and the full port lands down to the ship channel. Um, and um, what this primarily is about is how do we remove those lands from the floodplain. Uh, they are under a provincial special policy area, meaning they can't be redeveloped. Um, they can be, um, uh, work can happen, development can happen, but only based on existing industrial zoning. Um, and uh, certainly we couldn't look at complying with the city's central waterfront secondary plan, which is, um, you know, anticipating and has a vision for new neighborhoods, mixed-use commercial residential neighborhoods in the Portlands, um, and we can't do that today. So what does the Donmouth EA do? Um, the area in red is the uh, outline of the uh, Donmouth um, uh, EA uh, area. The, the Donmouth EA will establish the river channel and the greenway configurations for flood uh, conveyance will address naturalization and city building requirements for the Portlands, or for the Lower Donlands specifically. Um, we'll assess and identify an adaptive management strategy. Effectively what that means is that the, live, uh, the river is a living organism, I don't, organism may not be the right word, but it is certainly a, uh, something that will change over time, um, and an adaptive management strategy will allow TRCA to ensure that the, uh, the river, the habitats that are in the river will, uh, will thrive and succeed 
um, as uh, things change over the course of the life of the river. Um, the uh, Donmouth establishes, the EA establishes the phasing strategy for the river uh, and flood protection, the minimum elevations for all surrounding areas to ensure that uh, all areas are removed from the floodplain. Uh, it's not simply a matter of um, digging a new river. Uh, areas within the port lines actually have to be raised so that they don't flood. And uh, finally, it will define all of our flood protection requirements as we move forward. The Lower Don Lands Master Plan and Infrastructure EA, on the other hand, um, provides for uh, identification of the infrastructure that will allow for the river to um, be built, as well as for uh, development to occur in those areas that are removed from the floodplain. So firstly, it identifies the servicing requirements, um, water, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, roads, transit, cycling, pedestrian. It provides for um, bridges uh, across the river and uh, any utilities that are required to cross the river channel. And it provides for uh, details on road cross sections and uh, further details that I'll explain as we go further. So I want to start with just a reminder of where we were in October. Very quickly, um, we had, or the, the Portland's Acceleration Initiative had proposed um, primarily a phasing strategy for um, the flood protection for the new river. The river channel um, uh, and preferred option did not change radically. The same uh, solution was selected, uh, which provided for a low flow channel through the portlands with overflow channels at the uh, Don Greenway and the Keating Channel. Um, however, the primary differences, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later, uh, but one of the primary differences was uh, how do we accelerate? The best way to accelerate is to actually phase the flood protection and phase development, um, which also allows us to uh, begin to generate revenues from development that can be reinvested for future phases of flood protection. So where we were was um, existing with the flood protection or the flooded areas noted in yellow. Um, phase one, which provided for a 100 meter greenway connecting the Keating Channel to the ship channel, would remove the uh, Cousins and Polson's Key from um, the floodplain, provided those both were raised probably about a meter. Phase two then provided for a expansion of the greenway to about 200 meters wide, the construction of a raised berm along the Don Roadway um, to protect areas east of the Don, and the creation of a sediment management uh, area north of Lakeshore, as well as the extension of a number of uh, bridges across um, the Don Valley on Lakeshore. So that was phase two, and that released really all of the areas east of the Don River um, from, and the Don Roadway from flooding. Phase three then per, uh, was the creation of the low flow channel um, through the Portlands to the Polson Slip, which would release the final areas from uh, the floodplain. The final phase would then uh, occur, the final naturalization of the mouth of the Don would occur in the future um, once um, the Lafarge um, cement operation that occurs in the Polson Slip um, is relocated. Um, we don't know when that may be. Currently, Lafarge operates a, a facility there and intend to continue to operate that facility uh, for the foreseeable future. The primary change since October that we've dealt with is to reassess the, um, the phasing, the requirements of the phasing, um, and, um, and how it could, um, how that works. And, and essentially what we've done is um, looked at simplifying the phasing, simplifying the construction, and reducing the cost of uh, each of the phases. And I'll explain how that's been done. So firstly, uh, Council did ask us to look again at um, confirming the boundaries of the precincts. So we did that, we did an analysis, and in fact it looks like, or, or we've confirmed that we can add an area to the east of Cherry Street um, to phase one, so that when phase one is constructed, we'll actually be able to have Cherry Street um, redevelopment on both sides of Cherry, which actually makes a great deal of sense as opposed to having new facilities and buildings on one side and you know, continued post-industrial semi-wasteland on the other. Um, so that was the first thing we looked at. Um, but phase one really hasn't changed. Cousins Key and Polson's Key remain um, the uh, phase one development areas. 
Phase two really hasn't changed in terms of where it is either, although I will explain to you shortly what changes we've actually incorporated in phase one, phase two, and in phase three as we move forward. So the phases are, the areas of the phases have actually remained the same, but what we're doing in each phase is different. So let me start explaining that to you. If I can get it to work, there we go. So initially in phase one, I mentioned that we were looking at creating a new um, greenway, uh, which also operates as a spillway in the event of a flood, which would allow us to remove this area and this area from the floodplain. In fact, we don't need to do that. Um, the hydraulic uh, analysis that we've done has identified that with the removal of the existing Cherry Street Bridge here, or Keating Street Bridge on Cherry Street, and the removal of its abutments, and the creation of the new Cherry Street Bridge, um, and this was proposed um, initially, this hasn't changed from the original EA. Um, in doing so and raising the grades of those keys, we can remove them from the floodplain and not impact on any other properties uh, upstream or downstream of the river. So that is the first um, uh, real change in um, the phasing strategy. Uh, it's become simpler, it's become faster, it's something we can do, uh, I think, more quickly um, for less money. There we go. And the area of development that then is then released once that work is done is identified here. So we have the new Cousins Key Precinct, which uh, extends, I should look this way, which extends to uh, almost a, um, a Munition Street. And the Polson's Key are removed from the floodplain, um, provided, of course, that we raise the grades, or the grades are raised by the landowners, actually, and that the new Cherry Street alignment is constructed down to the Polson Slip. Um, in this case, uh, Lafarge continues to operate, remain in their existing, uh, existing space. We'll have to uh, mitigate for grading issues surrounding their site, but the intent is that Lafarge will be able to continue to operate um, through this development and into the future. Uh, and then the final thing that needs to be done uh, here is to fill S Rock Key, where the new Cherry Street Bridge um, will actually land on the Portlands. So that's phase one. Phase two. The main difference here in phase two is that rather than constructing a 200 meter wide um, greenway, which in the future we would reduce to 150 meters, um, and what that means is we would be um, incurring a substantial amount of throwaway costs uh, and then costs to rework in the future, we're actually proposing to construct that greenway in its final configuration in phase two. Um, so in order to do that, the area north of Commissioner Street will be constructed to approximately 200 meters wide. The area south of Commissioner Street and Basin Street would be constructed to approximately 150 meters wide. You can see that um, uh, we would also have to, as part of phase two, work on some um, uh, flood protection initiative at the Eastern Avenue underpass. Uh, that currently provides a conduit for water um, to get back into the Portland, so we would have to do some work there. Uh, and additionally, we've got some work to do, and this is actually a, a blow-up of this. Uh, we have to uh, work on the um, sedimentation pond here, a new flood protection landform here on the Unilever site, and a new valley wall feature here along the Don Roadway. Um, so those are the uh, components of phase two. Uh, and again, phase two releases, oh, and one last thing is raise the grades to the uh, east of the Don Roadway. Um, and as mentioned previously, phase two now removes all of the lands east of the Don Roadway from flood protection. Now, the um, cost benefit here is that the, uh, the cost of doing the spillway, um, because we're doing it to its final configuration and it's in fact narrower than originally proposed, should again be less expensive. And from a construction impacts perspective, we won't have to go back in and reconstruct this at a later date and impact any new residents or employees uh, or businesses um, that are now constructed across uh, the road on the Don Valley, or across the road of the Don Roadway. Just a um, little bit of an explanation. I mentioned north of Lakeshore, there is a flood protection landform south of Lakeshore. It's a uh, valley wall feature. The difference, it's a little technical, but um, not very complex, is a flood protection landform, and this is the similar uh, structure that has been used under uh, Corktown Common um, to protect the West Dawn lands. A flood protection landform structure provides for slightly more um, 
sloped sides, a clay core, and it can't be constructed um, through. You can't provide for pipes, you can't provide for ducts, you can't provide for any kind of infrastructure within a flood protection landform uh, because you would affect the structural capacity and integrity of that system. So that's being proposed here only because on the Don roadway we need to accommodate for new hydro, um, hydro one, um, potentially for a uh, new transit um, in the future, certainly for new water and sanitary and um, uh, gas lines. So for that reason we're actually going to be using what's called a uh, valley wall feature, and effectively a valley wall feature is just the raising of the land, much uh, softer slopes, as you can see there, here one to one and a half percent versus one and a half to three and a half percent. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. Um, but what that means is that the slope becomes um, quite a bit lar longer, and you can actually develop within that slope. We can put pipes in it, we can put buildings on it. Um, it's much more uh, structurally sound and stable than a flood protection landform is. So that's just a bit of detail on um, uh, this particular uh, piece of advancement. As I mentioned, um, uh, once that work is done in phase two flood protection, these are the areas that are released for development. We've got the film studio precinct um, where we'll be conducting a precinct planning exercise very shortly. Uh, the uh, entirety of the um, uh, south of eastern area. Again, there's a planning process underway for that area. Uh, and lastly, a small area which we couldn't do as part of phase one simply because of the uh, impact of that additional area on other properties. But this little piece of L-shaped property here on Villiers and Munition Street would actually become available for development uh, post phase two. I uh, want to give you a bit of a detail what um, 200 meters and 100 meters or 150 meters looks like and what the, uh, what the greenway will actually look like once constructed um, in, uh, in its uh, final configuration. So here, this area we're looking at is north of uh, Commissioner Street. Um, you can see it here as a blow-up um, showing uh, wetland habitats, or, or rather um, yeah, aquatic habitats, wetland habitats, um, valley slope transition areas and then terrestrial habitat and park um, at the top of slope. We've cut a section through here. It's very difficult on a small, even on, at this scale, to understand what 150 and 200 meters actually means. Um, so what we've done here is uh, tried to put it in a bit more human scale. So here we have the edge of buildings with sidewalks, um, Martin Goodman Trail, um, uh, really parkland and um, a high uh, areas outside of the floodplain um, leading into the valley, uh, the valley wall, the slope into the river here. You can see this is actually where the, the water is in the, uh, in the uh, low flow channel. Um, proposed to have, much like in uh, Corktown Common, boardwalks through um, so that you can, you know, people will be able to enjoy the wetlands, the uh, terrestrial habitats. Um, you can see that on the up, upper lands here, um, we have trees and, and shrubs and potentially parkland, uh, both active and passive, um, whereas we're more passive and lower, um, um, smaller shrubs that won't impact on flooding um, in the uh, top of bank, from the top of bank down. So that's an uh, example of what it will look like at 200 meters. So very quickly, I'll go to 150. You can see that the main difference is the area, treat area here, parkland area is somewhat narrower. Um, but in fact, 150 meters is what was proposed in Portland's Acceleration Initiative for both north and south of Commissioner Street. So north of Commissioners, in order to ensure we only have to build once, um, we've had to make it a little bit wider. Um, and we're happy about that. Um, it provides for a little more green space and it also will save us money over time. But again, you can see a very, very substantial um, uh, wetland habitat here, um, the aquatic habitat in blue uh, coming off the ship channel, which is right here. Effectively, the, the wetlands are almost the full width of the greenway in this case. But again, with boardwalks and pathways through and to um, so that they're not, um, you know, they're not human devoid. Then phase three. Phase three is the creation of the final low flow channel south of Commissioner Street, north of uh, the future Basin Street here, um, with the new channel into the um, uh, Polson Slip, um, and again with uh, wetland, aquatic habitat, wetland habitat, um, forested uplands, parklands, 
Um, and this, um, this obviously will release all of the balance of development areas within the lower Donlands for, uh, for development and from the floodplain. I'll just jump back very quickly. Um, we do have to construct this new bridge here, um, as well as based on, go that way, um, based on the final densities, um, potentially and likely a new bridge here across the river channel at what is called Basin Street that runs through the film studio area, or is proposed to run through the film studio area. Um, in all of these cases, we do have to fill uh, and raise the elevation of these development lands, whether it's in Cousins Key, Paulson's Key, east of the Don Roadway for a, uh, a portion, um, or these uh, river uh, precincts, um, probably anywhere from a meter to two meters. Those uh, raised grades happen effectively in the center um, and are proposed to come back down to meet existing dock walls all around the edge. So we're not looking at uh, um, raising substantial dock walls and spending uh, that kind of uh, infrastructure money. Um, although over time, many of these dock walls will have to be rebuilt. Um, they are, some of them are reaching the end of their useful lives. And then finally, phase four. Uh, in the future, uh, sometime in the future when um, Lafarge uh, deems that it can operate this uh, facility um, elsewhere more economically and it looks to um, uh, divest themselves of this property, the naturalization of the south side of the mouth of the river can occur, and that's what phase four represents. Point that way. So, just to recap, same four um, phases as before. Um, just the work that we're doing in the phases has been simplified um, and made more economical. Rather than actually constructing the greenway three times, which is in fact what we were looking at doing, and the reason we looked at that was because we were really concentrating on hydraulics for each of the phases. What did we need to do to actually accommodate the flooding? Um, and what that drove us to or led us to was a solution where we had a 100 meter greenway in phase one, a 200 meter greenway in phase two, and a 150 meter greenway in phase two. That involves a fair amount of throwaway costs. It also means that we're back in constructing and when we're constructing phase two, guess what, you can't get in there. And in fact, for phase one, maybe it can't be constructed so that you can actually use it because we, we're not gonna be constructing wetlands um, and all those other features that would go with it. So, so we think that this has really um, improved the plan quite a bit, and in fact, has accelerated it because phase one is actually quite a bit simpler now. It involves the construction of really a single bridge. Um, so it uh, minimizes throwaway costs, reduces first costs, and certainly helps us to meet our goals of accelerating um, what we're doing here. That's what we've done over the last eight months or so. So now I'm gonna talk a bit about the Don Mouth EA. Uh, before I move on to the uh, servicing. So again, just a bit of history, um, and this is kind of pro forma, we need to tell you about this so we can say that we did. Um, but I think all of you, or a lot of you have been here since you know, 2003 with the Central Waterfront Secondary Plan, the EA Terms of Reference in 2006, the design competition in 2007, um, the preferred option from 2010, the uh, alternative um, Portland's acceleration preferred option, and where we are today, um, not markedly different uh, from a layout perspective, but from how, uh, how we're gonna do it perspective, quite a bit different. Uh, and you can see 2014, um, we intend to present this and, and submit this to the Ministry of Environment uh, this fall and expect their reviews and um, final public comments um, will get us to a completion and a formal approval by middle of 2014. So EA process, we're actually here now. Um, we've been through this process twice, um, so I'm not gonna go back through it, um, but we are looking now at the preferred alternative, the impacts of that preferred alternative um, and changes to what we had already assessed back in 20, uh, prior to 2010. So what are the basic differences between 2010 and today? Um, basic differences are the greenway has been realigned to be adjacent to the Don Roadway. Um, it used to be uh, approximately there. Uh, the benefits of doing this are uh, public access to the greenway I think is substantially improved because now it's accessible off a of public street uh, before it would have been accessible through the backyards of um, 
condominiums, residential offices, whatever it may have been. Uh, additionally, um, we have created much more logical, sensible development blocks. They're now square, they're not distributed, they're not discrete, they're easier to service than what was previously proposed. So that's the first change. Second change is that the, um, uh, the river, the low flow channel through the portlands has been moved down um, to connect into the Polson Slip. That's allowed us to maintain Lafarge's operation, number one. Um, and it's also allowed us to maintain Commissioner Street as the primary east-west route through um, the Portlands. And as you'll see later, it, it, you know, in the previous plan, uh, Commissioner Street actually didn't exist. Um, Commissioner Street connected to Villiers Street. And I'll show you that shortly. We have also, in response to uh, concerns, initial concerns raised by uh, the Toronto Port Authority and Red Pass Sugar, removed the um, promontories here and here that uh, impacted on the navigation in the inner channel, uh, the inner harbour. Um, I should note that both the, um, this um, promontories issue as well as the Lafarge issue were, were issues prior to the Portland's Acceleration Initiative. We took the opportunity during that process to address those issues and in fact we've been able to address them and, and um, uh, satisfy their concerns as part of the overall plan that we've come up with. Um, but those things had to be addressed previously and we would have had to deal with them regardless of the Portland's Acceleration Initiative or not. Um, and then uh, finally, I think that's actually it. Uh, and then the, the last thing is we've, you know, we provided for the phasing of the river and that's really the, the five primary changes from 2010 to today. So how does the alternative fulfill the project goals? The terms of reference required flood protection, first and foremost, um, and this plan removes, well, I won't say 240 hectares um, from the floodplain, uh, because some of it remains floodplain, the, the area that's actually in the river valley remains floodplain, but we have protected um, all of the other areas from flooding. We have added, or will have added, uh, 14 hectares of aquatic habitat, and 16 hectares of terrestrial and wetland habitats. Um, and we have, uh, through the phasing and the rationalization of development, we think improved the city building um, performance and aspects of the plan um, as per this. So overview of the effects. Um, flood protection, uh, the phased construction of the river will uh, progressively remove areas from, from the floodplain and from the uh, province's special policy area. Uh, this is a good thing. Um, and as mentioned several times, we permanently remove the, um, the balance of the area from the floodplain once the work is complete. Uh, naturalization, I just mentioned, uh, high quality aquatic, uh, terrestrial, and um, um, sorry, wetland habitats uh, created um, for um, all manner of flora and fauna. We have the new river mouth, uh, which will provide greater opportunities for recreation. We have new parklands um, for uh, active um, recreation as well as passive recreation. And heritage, there's a number of heritage structures um, within the portlands that will be uh, addressed, whether through commemoration, um, uh, moval, uh, sorry, um, uh, relocation, um, or uh, simply leaving them where they are and raising them because the areas around them will be raised. Um, so we will address over time those heritage structures as well. From an operational perspective, um, the uh, work that we're doing, we're minimizing now um, throwaway costs. Uh, we're able to reuse uh, existing flood protection equipment, uh, specifically uh, dredging equipment within the uh, Keating Channel. Uh, and we'll be able to use the uh, dredge aid for further filling um, through uh, Tommy Thompson Park and uh, the Leslie Street Spit. The um, nuisance effects on businesses um, will be addressed during construction and in fact by the alternative phasing plan um, we've uh, removed a great amount of those nuisance effects because we're not going back in and reconstructing areas that we've already been in once. And then finally from a sustainability perspective um, uh, just as previously proposed, we expect to be able to um, reuse soils um, that are excavated uh, for the river in order to raise grades um, to the extent possible, create a uh, zero balance cut and fill um, so that we're neither importing nor exporting soils 
um, that's a very positive thing from a cost perspective as well as a um, uh, you know, social economic perspective, removing trucks and um, carbon uh, from the roads. So um, as well as all of the th good things about having a river like carbon uh, sequestration, um, better air quality because of the additional green and tree canopy, um, and uh, the ability to accommodate uh, flora and fauna in habitats. So that was the Don Mouth. For the Lower Donlands, EA Master Plan, um, it has actually been approved um, both by the city and by the Ministry of Environment. Uh, what we are doing is we are amending an existing approval, uh, and effectively the amendment we're looking at is more or less south of the Keating Channel. Work north of the Keating Channel is um, has not been affected, and in fact, there's um, very some vigorous um, planning development work going on um, uh, by the private sector in the uh, uh, Keating North Keating areas today. So, what does the Lower Donlands Master Plan and Infrastructure EA address? Water services, sanitary roads, bridges, transit, and stormwater, uh, primarily. I'm going to walk you through now um, the changes that have been. Uh, made to respond to the um, revised flood protection scheme. They really are very minor um, and really only um, come about because of um, uh, the relocation of roads um, or bridges from one plan to the next. So let me walk you through that. From a water infrastructure perspective, you can see on the left um, the purple lines show where the major water lines um, were originally. Um, on the right, uh, most of them haven't changed. The main changes are shown here in bold, and they really reflect the fact that um, Commissioner Street and Basin Street are the primary east-west routes now, as opposed to Villiers Street. And um, in the future, or sorry, in the previous plan, there was a suggestion of a, um, a Basin Street or a road here along the dock wall, um, which we wouldn't have provided servicing in, but now we can provide servicing in this reconfigured road. So that's the water from a sanitary perspective. Again, changes really have to do with the change in um, road configuration. The services will be in the road right of way. Um, and the roads and the services actually make a, a lot more sense. They're, I think they're more economical. Um, they serve areas um, better um, and uh, more logically. You can see here, uh, to get to this area was uh, required quite a bit of um, work to get through the river, uh, to get through the greenway. Um, and those were not cheap things to try and build underneath, uh, underneath these areas. Would have been very, very expensive and very difficult to actually get into if there were problems in the future. Uh, no, when there are problems in the future, because 100 years from now, those pipes will need to be replaced. Uh, from a road perspective, I mentioned the primary change um, is here, Billiard Street um, previously connecting to Commi uh, Commissioner Street. Uh, Commissioner Street now goes straight through, is the primary road, Villiers Street becomes a local road, um, and uh, um, much, a much quieter road. Um, and then here we have, again, the proposed Basin Street connector um, across to the Don Roadway. Just some um, examples of road cross-section. So the top one reflects what's proposed for Cherry Street. Uh, you can see we've got uh, LRT in its own right-of-way here with um, pathway, walkway, sidewalk, um, uh, bicycle trails, uh, or on-street uh, cycle paths. Now, these haven't been designed. We're not at a detailed design stage, so you know, we can't say whether these are on, uh, on road or in a separate um, elevated uh, bike path uh, similar to um, Spadina or not similar to Spadina. Those details will be fleshed out over time. Uh, as the designs for these uh, facilities are actually um, completed. But you can see here the main thing to note is that the uh, transit is on the east side of the road. Um, again, in order to minimize the amount of cross traffic, so cars that are actually turning in front of uh, the LRTs, um, we've uh, selected the side of the road that has the least amount of um, driveways or access requirements on it. Um, similarly, here on Commissioner Street, the uh, LRT is proposed to be on the south side of the road. In fact, there will be no crossings between Cherry Street and the Don Roadway um, to the south because the river runs there. 
So this will actually run along the, um, the banks of the river effectively um, and will have complete uh, primacy as it cross, uh, crosses the lower Donlands and the portlands. Um, one of the other things we had to look at was the uh, Basin Street uh, crossing um, because it's now not um, proposed on the dock wall. Uh, there are a number of ways that it could be handled. Um, one as a bridge, um, you know, a fairly you know, simple or less than simple bridge structure, but a bridge structure. Uh, alternative two is um, it could be a causeway and or bridge uh, combination. And third, uh, River Ford. And um, it doesn't show it here, but actually the details are on the, uh, on the boards. Uh, but effectively, um, a bridge provides the least amount of impact to the river. Uh, Ford or a causeway will actually impact on the flow of the um, flow of the floodwaters uh, through the greenway, uh, impacting then on the um, usability and the size of the greenway. So after all of the analysis was completed, um, looking at the environment issues, economic issues, cultural transportation issues, um, the uh, consulting team has identified that a bridge is the preferred alternative. Uh, for the uh, potential future Basin Street crossing. And I say potential because it's, it's likely to happen, but the, um, the densities of development on the South uh, River Precinct block are really what will determine the requirement, the ultimate requirement for a bridge or no bridge um, in that location. Although Cassidy will tell me there are planning considerations as well. Um, ah, bridges, as I mentioned. Primary change here, um, the bridge on Commissioner Street, um, now not connecting Villiers to Commissioners, but connecting Commissioners to Commissioners. Um, minor change to the bridge here. Um, as you can see, it's now crossing the Polson Slip, so it's a little bit bigger than it was, um, a little bit further south than it was when the river uh, channel was a little further north. Uh, and then the proposed Basin Street Bridge here, connecting over into the uh, studio lands on the other side of the Don Roadway. Um, you can't read this, I don't expect you to. All this is here to suggest is we had to look at the elevations of the bridges. The bottom, uh, the key thing here is the bottom cord of these structures has to be above the high water line. Uh, and in fact, should be beyond the high water line because any uh, debris floating through the river, we don't want to start jamming up against these bridges. So the bridges have to be high enough that um, any floodwaters um, and debris flowing under them aren't getting caught on them. Transit. Uh, from a transit perspective, um, again, proposed to be LRT. Um, so transit in its own right of way, not uh, on or, or combined in uh, regular street traffic. Uh, primary change here is that the, uh, again, the main route has changed from Villiers to Commissioner Street. Um, we have the Cherry Street um, uh, LRT down to a loop for now, um, potentially sometime in the future heading further down into um, the uh, area south of the ship channel. But um, as you can see, there was previously a proposed um, LRT line along with a bridge here on the Don Roadway. This wasn't actually part of the EA. It was notional. Uh, it remains notional, but we've actually taken it off the drawings here because um, the city uh, is proceeding with a uh, master plan, or excuse me, a transportation and uh, services EA for the <clears throat> all of the other areas, the Portlands, and in fact this area, uh, the Don Roadway Transit and the bridge across the ship channel will be looked at as part of that environmental assessment over the next 11 to 12 months. From a uh, stormwater management perspective, really no changes. The only change here is reflective of the configuration of the development areas. Um, you can see here two sort of different colored areas. What this shows is um, in accordance with the City of Toronto's wet weather master plan, buildings have to control stormwater um, at the source. So they, they have to deal with um, the quality of water and the quantity of water that they can discharge from their sites. In these areas, that discharge will go to a um, City of Toronto water treatment facility, um, much like we are constructing for um, the West Islands and East Bayfront, um, prior to it being discharged to the lake. And, and at those facilities, the, um, the water is treated, it's clarified, and um, it, it's treated through ultraviolet to remove any bacteria before it goes back into the lake. 
Um, the area in blue, however, is proposed to be um, uh, used to surcharge uh, wetland habitats within the river. So uh, stormwater runoff from these buildings would actually be used um, to um, ensure that this remains wet, even in dry seasons. Um, and it's uh, uh, really quite a clever um, solution uh, to controlling, uh, both controlling stormwater as well as ensuring that the, the river and its habitats are sustainable. That's the Lower Donlands Master Plan. So next steps. Um, you're all interested in, you know, we're getting the EA done, but when is this going to be built? Unfortunately, I can't tell you when it's going to be built, but we are certainly looking at how can it be funded, um, and we have to sort that out before we can determine when we're going to build it. Um, so in that regard, um, the city have conducted a development charges background study. Uh, it went to uh, the executive committee, it was earlier this month, um, was deferred until the fall to allow for city staff to have additional negotiations with landowners and developers across the city. Uh, but effectively, the, um, what it means is that um, some of this work, um, infrastructure and flood protection work, has been proposed to be um, applied as a citywide development charge. So any developments across the city would pay uh, an amount of money um, that would then be used by the city to fund this as well as parts of this as well as other work across the city. Um, so that is uh, happening. The city is also exploring the opportunity to have an area-specific development charge um, that would be levied against local um, developers um, to again fund some of this uh, infrastructure and flood protection work. Uh, the landowners, or at least a number of the landowners in the Portlands and south of Leslie have uh, formed a landowners group. Um, they're interested in um, their planning permissions, they're interested in development charges, and ultimately we're interested in understanding what they're prepared to contribute to um, the cost of this infrastructure and flood protection um, as they are you know, substantial beneficiaries from um, its ultimate uh, construction. Um, so that's actually uh, happening and ongoing and we'll continue those discussions, negotiations will continue for some time, I expect. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the city, uh, city staff, Waterfront Toronto, TRCA staff, you know, are continuing to um, discuss opportunities for funding, um, utilizing Waterfront Toronto's effectively use, utilizing our funding model, um, providing tripartite um, funding through the three uh, levels of government um, to address this flooding issue. And, and I mean, I don't need to remind you of two weeks ago here or three weeks ago in Calgary or six weeks ago here in Toronto um, it, or last year in New York. I mean, flooding is... Uh, is uh, uh, on everyone's mind. It's obviously happening. Um, it's happening a lot lately, and um, I, you know, I think there's there there may be opportunities given that that um, uh, governments will look at this as a as an investment to save money in the future, as opposed to uh, a cost today. Um, I mentioned. Uh, the schedule, and I won't uh, uh, belabor the point, uh, but effectively this fall we will complete these two um, EAs. Uh, with your input now, um, we will uh, finish off our analysis and submit in the fall, and uh, MOE will, uh, we expect, complete their assessment um, and um, mandated requirements by uh, the summer of 2014. Um, just very high level, uh, some of the other things we're doing, and these were, uh, again, um, uh, directed by council uh, that we start looking at some of the planning issues. So framework planning for the rest of the portlands to ensure that as development starts, it's um, happening in a smart way and in a coordinated way. Um, we look. We need to look at the uh, servicing and transportation issues surrounding that. Um, so there's an EA um, um, going to happen there as well, and uh, and that uh, procurement process is now underway. Uh, south of Eastern Strategic Direction, uh, that has been going on for some time at the city uh, and has been um, folded into this process because the area south of Eastern and the Portlands are, are really tied to each other from a transportation uh, link, uh, linkages perspective. Um, and uh, I mentioned that the uh, uh, South of Eastern EA will look at, um, and Portlands EA will look at the streets, um, connections, uh, pedestrian and cycling facilities, servicing infrastructure or any other um, infrastructure the city requires um, from a, you know, parks and, and um, community centers and other at a very high level, but at looking at those issues as well. Um, and we are also uh, kicking off some precinct planning um, work. 
uh, in the film studio uh, district. The city are uh, starting to do um, some planning with the uh, local landowners there. Uh, and in the Cousins Key Precinct, uh, by the same token, um, Waterfront Toronto and the city are about to kick off uh, that precinct planning process as well. Um, I would note that the Polson Key Precinct planning process is uh, currently on hold, uh, pending um, um, really interest being shown by um, the landowners there um, uh, to, uh, uh, to undertake precinct planning for their lands. And here's... Uh, bit of a schedule for how that's going to happen. You can see that the planning framework uh, and the EA, we're looking at some uh, in Q4 of this year, uh, strategic advisory committee meetings um, and uh, um, public meetings to begin to get uh, feedback on those planning uh, and EA requirements. Uh, film studios, um, that will happen, uh, public input um, in Q1 2014 and the Queen's Key uh, precinct plan uh, will also start in Q3 uh, and will be out to the public in Q3, Q4, and Q1 of next year um, to start getting feedback on uh, that planning as well. I think the discussion is my last slide.